Hello, I'm Manoj Karmakar. Welcome to ISSPS TV. If you like any of our videos, do remember to click the like and share button. If you are new to our channel, do remember to subscribe so that you can get regular notification of any future uploads. Now, uh, for all of you who are there, uh, we've gone through a bit of information in uh, during the lectures. And I think uh, it's fair to say that the cadaver anatomy, the CT, MRI, and the, and the sonographic imaging was really put together a holistic approach to what we really aimed to do. And I think for the participant, I hope it was fruitful. Now, when you're looking at real-time scan for individuals, if you look at, uh, put it here, it's okay, don't worry. Uh, when you look at uh, ultrasound imaging, we're looking at the lumbar spine, as you can see here. Um, Renji, can you please? Uh, we are now uh, imaging the lumbar spine. We place some landmark marks here. This is the ilia crest. Uh, these are the interspinous spaces. And as Bernard mentioned, that these spinous processes may not always be tallied up one above the other. Now, later on, when we talk about ultrasound imaging in scoliosis, we will be talking about an SP line. That means a spinous process line. That means we will join these uh, tip of the spinous process together so that we can then see the, uh, the spinous process line. Uh, and any deviation from this usually suggests that there is an abnormality in the uh, orientation or there may be some rotation in the spine. This is not working, right? It's working, huh? Okay, good. Right, so uh, put it on Mac view for me, please, just to make it easier. Mac view on the top right, yeah. yeah. Okay, so first of all, this is a curve array transducer. It is uh, five to one megahertz. Uh, and for this demonstration, when I perform a transverse scan, it will represent the right side of this volunteer. This is his head end. This is obviously the back end. Okay, when I do a sagittal scan, the orientation marker will be pointing towards the head of the patient. So whenever you see a sagittal view, that'll be the head end. When you see a transverse view, it will be the right side of the patient. Now. So as I mentioned, you can do a midline median sagittal scan, but we tend to do this median sagittal scan because we find it's not very useful and it's sometimes it's very difficult to acquire this because it's maybe because the spinous processes are not one below one over the other. So like you can see here, you can see a spinous process in the cranial end, but it's not really lined up against the other. So and through the interspinous spaces, you can see the posterior dura and the anterior complex with the thecal sac in between. So I think the paramedian window is by far more commonly used. <clears throat> so in order to do a paramedian sagittal scan, we need to start from the sacrum. So we start at the level of the sacrum. You can see here at the, you can see on the, at the caudal end, you can see a large flat surface of the sacrum. And as I move more cranially, that's the sacrum. And then as you can see, the first lamina of L5. Now, can you please uh, increase the depth for me a little bit? Okay, so here's your sacrum and the lumbar sacral gap, which is the uh, L5 S1. And you see the lamina of L5. And then the lamina of L4. So you can count cranially and see that this is three, four, and five. Okay. So this is three, four, and five. And given this anatomy, I think four and five is the PGS that I can see here. So I'm going to now <coughs> optimize this view. Just move the focus up a touch, please. If you reduce the depth now so we can get a bit more magnification. Okay, good. And then a little bit more depth, reduce it. 
Okay, so you can see the lamina of L4 and L5 very clearly. Actually, you can even see the epidural space uh, outlines here. This is the narrow epidural space with the intervening uh, fat-filled space, I suppose, the posterior dura behind. And in the thecal sac, you can also see there are some pulsating coda equina. Uh, these are the white um, streaks of uh, white lines, if you may. And that usually is the coda equina nerves that are located here. So these are the lamina here uh, and the anterior complex, as you can see here. This anterior complex is very wide because his, actually you can freeze the image for me. And you can use the internal caliper to measure the width of the interlamellar space or the lip width of the, of the anterior complex. And this will tell you how wide the given um, lumbar interspace is. However, uh, this is a young man, he's a volunteer. <clears throat> and uh, this is not the real scene when you're ducking and diving in the operating room and you're in the real world. I like that word, Kenneth. <clears throat> so you will find that patients have much narrower interlamellar spaces. They have much narrower acoustic windows. But a, a pearl for you is that look for the anterior complex because the anterior, you can go live again, please. The anterior complex is a, is a good um, indicator of whether there is a, a, a narrow space or not. And sometimes you may also see in the, in the distal lamina that there may be some osteophytes. Uh, these are also seen when the interlamellar spaces are, uh, are ossified. These osteophytes would extend into the interlamellar space and therefore restricting the, uh, the posterior um, complex width and therefore the anterior complex width also will be reduced. So uh, this is a, a, a normal individual. So from posterior to anterior, you can see the erector spinae muscle. You can see the... Uh, a lamina of L3, 4, and 5, and we've chosen 4, 5 because this is the space where I can see it best. Uh, the, the thecal sac is, uh, uh, is the anechoic space, uh, posterior dura, the anterior complex, and the thecal sac. Okay, so here. Now, somebody asked about uh, how to detect the position of a catheter in the epidural space. Now, one of the ways that uh, one may use is the use... Um, Poplar imaging after, after the injection of saline. Now, uh, of course, it depends where the tip of the catheter is, but imagine your catheter is in this epidural window. <clears throat> okay, you can see this epidural space. If you inject uh, normal saline through your catheter rapidly, you will see a, a, a kind of a, a, a blush of colors, as they often describe. That means... Um, it indicates a turbulent flow within the epidural space. So therefore you can see, um, uh, it can be an indicator. It can also be used for caudal epidural injections uh, and uh, to locate the catheter. But again, the limitation is if your catheter tip is in the acoustic shadow, then it could lead to a false negative. So, however, um, people often ask me, um, how do you detect the needle uh, that is in the thecal sac. In fact, after we published our report on uh, dry taps, they said, oh, you checked it with the ultrasound, you did not aspirate the needle, then couldn't you have used Doppler? And I think uh, the various researchers have also reported <coughs> using Doppler imaging for determining the tip of a catheter within the thecal sac. I think there are some limitations and this needs to be validated because when you inject into the thecal sac, you inject it at a very low speed of injection. It's an obvious reason so that you don't get an unexpected high level of spread. Now, you're injecting slow into a fluid-filled space, so the flow is typically laminar, put it this way. And if there's laminar flow, it should not lead to any Doppler signal uh, changes. Whereas in order to see a Doppler change, you have to inject it relatively fast. In fact, um, Dr. Ben Sui did some work in a bench uh, in some animals, and they showed that you need somewhere between one mil per minute of injection to see the Doppler signal. So that means you are injecting uh, at a very fast rate of injection. Uh, so if, if, you, if your rate of injection is slow, 
then you may not see any Doppler change, although your needle is in the thecal sac. So bear that in mind. So aspiration would be the best test. If you don't, then uh, seeing the needle within the thecal sac would be a good option. Next is, uh, I'd like you to show you the uh, adjacent anatomy. So we are now at the, uh, at the sacrum, lumbosacral junction, L45345. So now I'm going to move the transducer laterally, okay? So you can see here, <clears throat> these are the articular processes. These are the articular pillars that form the facet joints. Uh, and uh, if you go further laterally, you can see the transverse processes and the acoustic shadows. You can increase the depth for me, please. Uh, you can see the uh, transverse, uh, sh the shadow of this psoas muscle. And uh, he's got a large psoas muscle there, some hypo to hyperechoic um, shadows within the thick psoas muscle. Please more. And then you can see the uh, retroperitoneal bowel and uh, the, the motility of the bowel, I suppose. And you can see the psoas muscle in, in, in between the acoustic shadow. This, uh, we will use this more so for lumbar plexus injections and, and so and so forth. However, if you are performing a neuraxial intervention and you see this structure, then it usually implies your transducer is a little bit too, too far uh, lateral. You need to swing it a little bit more medial, like you see here. And once you move it more medially, you can see the neuraxial anatomy much more clearer. And uh, uh, so it is a, a paramedian, as you can see here. If I just did a true paramedian sagittal scan, you can see here the image is not as good. You are seeing only a narrow section of the thecal sac. It's probably only looking at the... Um, at the uh, lateral sulcus of the thecal sac, if I may use that word. Uh, in contrast, when you watch what happens when I tilt it, you tilt it and then there is some slide involved. So remember, it's not only a case of tilting. And as I mentioned that there is no absolute number or degree. So you have to tilt it and then slide it till you get a good view of the posterior dura. And then you optimize your other machine related fact, um, your parameters till you get this good view. Now, uh, you can freeze it there for me, so I don't have to hold it. And once you have positioned your um, transducer and you have uh, steadied the image, uh, Ranjit, can you please use the caliper and show how the needle would emerge? So we are going to insert the needle from a caudal direction here. You will see here, it would end up from the caudal end of the transducer. So it would emerge from there and you guide it towards the the dura, as you can see here in this case, the arrow is now, um, the caliper is uh, showing the, uh, the direction in which the needle would be inserted uh, and so. Okay, uh, I would also like to show you the transverse view, which is the, can be useful. Again, as I mentioned, when we do the transverse scan, uh, the orientation marker is pointing to the right of the patient, okay? So let's start from, the sacrum. So we start from the sacrum here. Uh, can I have some gel, please? Okay, here you go. So we are starting from uh, the sacrum. Actually, you can see here. Right. So it is the median sacral crest in the midline. Just put it there. You can see that's the median sacral crest. The sacroiliac joints are laterally, okay? And the iliac crest would be further out. So now we are going to move the transducer cephalad. You can see some, um, he has some, no, no, no. He has some um, anosification in the deficit in the sacrum itself. And then you go cephalad, you'll see the lumbosacral junction. This is the anterior complex. You can see the lateral, uh, elements and the thickle sac would be in the middle, in the uh, laterally. So that you can see the posterior dura here and the dark space in the middle is your thickle sac. Okay. Now, uh, if I go more proximally, you can see the L5. This is the spinous process of L5. As we said, uh, you can use this to identify the midline and determine where the midline is located. You can go further up. So this is your L4, L5. So this is the transverse interspinous view that I alluded to. 
In fact, in this case, you can see in the, in the dependent side, which is his left, you can see the facet joints also very nicely here, the articular processes, uh, and possibly that's the facet joint with the hypoechoic gap there. So you can see the posterior dura and the anterior complex. Now, uh, if I were to do a, a spinal injection here, uh, we are obviously for dexterity, you can do it from, from this side too. But this is going to come from the non-dependent side. Okay? Uh, we prefer to do it from the dependent side so that your needle would emerge from, from here. And we use a, 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 an introducer needle, which would first come from the, yeah, and then insert the introducer needle. It's like an aiming device, if you may. And then through that, you can insert your much thinner final needle. It punctures the dura, and you get your thecal sac. So I think uh, a randomized study now, can you go live again? A randomized study now comparing um, a paramedian sagittal and a dependent TIPD, uh, the transverse interspinous, uh, a transverse in-plane dependent technique is underway. And uh, we are looking at what the CSF efflux um, rates are from the non-dependent and the dependent side. I can always tell you the result. The CSF reflux is a much faster from the TIPD approach from the dependent side than from the non-dependent side. So the question, though, it begs the question, why don't we then all do spinals from the dependent side? Why aren't we taught to do spinals from, uh, from paramedian spinals from the dependent side? Actually, there isn't any literature to say so. It only says that paramedian approach may be better than the median approach uh, for the thoracic epidural. But for the lumbar approach, and especially in the elderly, also a paramedian approach may be better because uh, the midline may be ossified, that it may be narrowed, and many age-related changes may uh, make a midline approaches difficult. So paramedian approaches are, are desirable. So I think uh, these are some of the, uh, the, the facts. So I think ultrasound imaging using curved linear transducers, as you can see with a Good machine with uh, where you can optimize the image appropriately goes a long way in performing these scans. Secondly, next, uh, finally, I like to uh, show you the uh, position of the uh, uh, the uh, L five S one. Okay, now now we have L four five and S one here. Uh, okay, can you please uh, freeze the image for me? Okay, we have L. 4, L5, and S1 here. Um, it also appears to me that the thecal sac is narrowing towards the L5, S1. Uh, now the question I have is, um, anyone, either Kenneth or um, Bernard can answer this is, is it real that the L5, S1 is a much bigger space than L4, L5, one? Two is, is the CSF content at the L5 S1, significantly less than at the L4 L5. Uh, I mean, uh, Kenneth alluded to a lake. So, does the lake get shallower as you go caudally? So, um, can I hear your uh, views, please? Hey, Manash, it's uh, Ken here. Um, I'm not sure about the interlaminar measurements. Actually, I haven't I haven't gone and looked at it. But certainly, from your scans, it certainly looks bigger uh, it'd be an interesting thing to just do some measurements there um, it's really not that obvious on the ct scan or mri that the l5 s1 interlaminar space is that much bigger uh, and it could be positional as well because you've got your patient in the fetal position for example that's one thing um, and the csf spaces i think because of the tapering of the spinal canal uh, the volume is probably going to be less at L5 S1 versus higher up. Uh, but I'll leave it to Dr. Bernard to uh, illuminate. Okay, thank you. So if you have a look um, at the lumbar spine from lateral, that means the spinous processes uh, direct posteriorly. And you will recognize if you do not do uh, get rid of your lordosis, the normal direction 
of the spinous processes in the upper part of the lumbar spine is more downwards in the middle. It's more strictly posterior. And the secret is that the L5 spinous process, if you have a normal anatomy, a normal non-change, not pathological uh, spine, in many cases, it points a little bit upwards. That is the reason why the space in normal uh, people is often wider. This is not true in many people having alterations or even um, variations in the lumbosacral uh, junction. So you can't say it's always the case, but what Manoj pointed out is a very good thing. Um, saying if you have um, ossification, etc., like spondylosing ankylitis, it is almost always the case that those pathologies do not affect L5 as one or not as often as, as in the higher levels. That means I, I, I personally had the experience in, in a nurse when they called me um, in the pain department and they said they, they tried to do an access to the spinal canal and they could not succeed at all. So they tried several times and they said, do you have a solution? I said, yes, I can try. Try the L5 S1 and it worked. So it's not... The, the, the most important thing is not, is it wider? It is sometimes the only chance you have. What's your views about the uh, fecal sac and uh, the CSF volumes? I have no data on that. Logically speaking, I would say yes, it's, it's less than, than in, in the upper part. I think these are some uh, interesting um, aspects of... Uh, neuroaxial blocks that we really don't have much data about. I must uh, refer to a work by the Professor Prats Galliano Galino from Barcelona uh, and uh, Dr. Sala Blanche, where they did in cadavers uh, measure uh, with segmentation, uh, you know, the volumes of CSF and uh, soft tissue. But I think there is a limitation in the data because when the individual is deceased, uh, usually, the uh, the uh, the brain usually the brain volume goes down. So most of the CSF uh, from the lumbar spine usually dislocates to the to the brain. So and uh, I have often seen in cadaver models when you do ultrasound guided spinal, uh, the thecal sacs are quite narrow, and this may reflect that. So uh, it really this is um, uh, Kenneth. This really um, uh, highlights that. Maybe this is an area that needs more research in terms of measurements and volumes. And it's, it's quite simple to do in, uh, in radiology because there's a um, wealth of data uh, yeah. in the archives and all you need is just somebody to sit and uh, segment these as uh, ASF and tissue and then work out the various ratio. Mm. Uh, and uh, finally is that the L5S1 always seems to be the savior uh, and always saves the day. Uh, I don't know why, because the L5S1, uh, whether it is um, inflammatory disease, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, seems to be the last space that usually gets uh, uh, occluded. Of course, uh, if you can't see anything through the L5S1, more likely that you'll not be able to see anything through any other space. Uh, and in these difficult patients, uh, for uh, the, the registrants who are signing in here is that when you anticipate a lot of difficulty, don't hesitate to request a, a high resolution CT because the CTs can be done very quickly nowadays. Uh, and of course there is some radiation involved, but it may help you to plan uh, the interlamellar space through which you can best perform the intervention. Whether it is L5S1, L34, et cetera, uh, it, uh, it, it has uh, allowed us to do so. And we think it is uh, something that is available in most uh, hospitals today and should become an integral part of your planning when you perform these procedures in, uh, in real time. Okay, finally, uh, Mano, I'd like to, we have, uh, yes, Mano, anybody uh, only, has to say? Only to complete. Uh, yeah. in, in relation to the, uh, this study uh, about the measure of uh, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, it, it was in patient, not in cadaver. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, okay. And, 
around the the patient uh, have around five milliliters uh, per uh, vertebral level at Lamar ratio. Uh, in, in general, uh, in in the in the old books, the uh, the total uh, amount of cerebrospinal fluid uh, is uh, mentioned as uh, 150 milliliters, but uh, act, actual uh, is uh, is more. Uh, at uh, at uh, spinal level is uh, 100 milliliter and encephalic uh, volume of cerebrospinal fluid uh, add uh, another uh, 100 milliliter. In total, 200, two, uh, 250 milliliter is the total volume, encephalic and spinal. Right. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, I, my 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 apologies. Uh, I I I must have overlooked that. It's uh, if it is in patients, then obviously that data, the ratios, and all they have calculated shows that there are no differences. But given that the Kodak quina is so compact in the L5 S1, uh, and the thecal sac is narrowing, it would seem something uh, that the CSF content is would be lower. But maybe I'm wrong here. But again, uh, we see a lot of paresthesia when you put a L5S1 and you put the needle in, the patient will often say, ouch, because uh, you are more likely to touch the cord equina nerves at the L5S1 than at the L4, L5, I think so. Okay, finally, okay, this is an uh, interesting area and you will find it useful. Now, for those of you who are still uh, here with us, this is a, a, a matrix transducer. Unlike your normal linear transducer, which has uh, 256 crystals, or maybe more nowadays, uh, in the footprint, uh, but this has, uh, in the thousands, this has like uh, uh, somewhere around 9,000 elements in the footprint, and everything is electronically steered, and there are no moving parts. So this is, uh, can generate very uh, high-quality uh, 3D data uh, in real time. And therefore, the refresh rates are much faster. Unlike um, the mechanical transducers, which are really big, and many of you may have seen in obstetrics, they use these big um, integrated mechanical transducers. But these are, there are no moving parts. It is uh, just a little bit, uh, um, pretty much comparable to a linear transducer, if you may, a little bit heavier. It's a bit of wider footprint. But... Uh, Everything is electronically stared. Now, this one is phased array. Uh, and uh, so it acquires uh, transverse, sagittal, and circumferential data at the same time. So we are now uh, not going to use it for uh, 3D without the coronal view, but uh, we can show you how the, um, how the biplanar view, view will be. So this is a 2D view of the, of the lumbar spine of the same space of the L4, L5 that we, we saw before. Okay, so let me uh, optimize this. Now it's very important principle with uh, multi-planar imaging is that uh, you have to make sure your 2D images are good uh, because if your 2D images are not good, your volume will be poor and therefore anything you render thereafter will be poor. So in this case, we are doing real time by planar imaging. So this is uh, in 2D. Uh, how about you reduce the focus a little bit? It reduce, improve the refresh rate a little bit. Yeah, okay. I'll move it up a little bit. Okay, good. So here you can see the posterior dura. Uh, can we go on to chroma, please? Uh, now, um, we are using a little bit of a, a color uh, 2D imaging here because it can improve the contrast visibility of the structures. Now, color imaging is not often used in anesthesiology because people are not aware what this thing, what this, what is the role of this uh, 2D imaging. Actually, did you know your eyes are engineered for color, not for black and white? Uh, we are more, uh, we can visualize color better and perceive colored images better as opposed to lions and uh, other hyenas who roam the, the wild in the dark. You are very poor in seeing things in the dark, but much better in the bright. So uh, this actually you will often find if you change it to uh, one of these color palettes, 
it gives you better visualization of the structures that I, I can often see, especially when the, uh, when the contrast of the images are poor. Now, I think this is giving me a pretty good image of the interspinous view, okay? Now, I'm going to now, as you can see, the images in the, in the, in the transverse view, okay? Now, I'm going to now switch it to the paramedian sagittal, and then we acquire the paramedian sagittal view. You can see here, uh, go to the um, epia color. Oh, look at that. The dura is much better now, see? Okay, now this is just a 2D view. I like you to see the number that you see on the top left end of the screen. It says 33 Hertz. Now, for those of you who are not very familiar with what this means is that this is uh, the number of frames per second. Uh, normally when you see a movie, Hollywood movie, it usually a uh, cinematographic movie, it's usually 24 frames per second. So anything above 24 will be similar to what you see in day-to-day -day TV, et cetera. Uh, now, why this is important means the more resources you use, the slower the, ref the, the, the refresh rate will be. But you can see here, because this is using electronic steering and et cetera, and in real time, it's still being able to give us 33 frames per second. And this is perfectly conducive for doing real-time interventions. And we have done um, some studies with it and we will be sharing our experience very soon. But I'd like to show you how you can use it to do biplanar imaging. Now, can you go on to, yeah, explain please. Now imagine the image to your left is our primary image, which is our sagittal image, okay? And then it has a, a, a line in the middle, which is actually the plane at which it is cutting the hemi uh, spinal view, okay? This is the, Oh, don't freeze it. Now, you can see that I'm doing a right paramedian sagittal oblique scan here. You can see the angle of my transducer. It's a little bit oblique so that I can insonate the uh, dura good. Now we place that central line. Just move the central line left and right a little bit. As you move the line, you see the, the image on your right changes because it is now changing the, tra the transverse view. But this is not the entire... Uh, interspinous transverse view. It is just the hemi view of the transverse view on the, on the right side. So on the image on your right, you can see the half of the thecal sac. Can you appreciate that? Uh, just show them what I'm trying to describe. Yeah. So you can see that that is the uh, dura, uh, posterior dura, and you can see the epidural space posteriorly, and the anterior dura is more anteriorly. So that is the hemi view of the, uh, or the biplanar view. Let's go live again before we end it. So uh, you can see here, this is the paramedian sagittal oblique. And you can see, so if you insert a needle in, in under real-time ultrasound guidance, you can use the, the image on your right to actually track the needle as it comes in the transverse view. So in essence, you can see the needle both in out of plane and in plane simultaneously. But the limitation is that the out of plane view will only appear when your needle touches that line that's delivering the, uh, the, tr the transverse view. In fact, you can move the secondary plane. So just move the line left and right a little bit. So as you see, I can, as the needle is approaching, you can move that plane left and you can move it right. Okay, so as the needle approaches the dura, you can slowly track it and insert it into the epidural space. Okay, so can you freeze it there? Okay, good. So uh, this is a, <coughs> a six, um, X uh, one to six, so this is our six megahertz. Uh, today we have uh, transducers. <coughs> uh, we are working with uh, 14 megahertz, uh, uh, X matrix transducers, the 14 megahertz transducers actually give you very high resolution images of the, uh, of the anatomy. Uh, and they are perfectly conducive for doing musculoskeletal, vascular imaging, et cetera. Originally designed for carotid scanning, but we have been using it for host of different musculoskeletal 
uh, anatomy, interventions, etc. So with these few words, I think uh, I would like to end this demonstration. Uh, I hope all of you had had a, a great um, morning, afternoon, evening, if I may say. I think I surely learned a lot during these uh, few hours. Uh, and to be able to share our experience with you was a true pleasure. Uh, please join me in um, thanking uh, the other faculty, uh, particularly Bernhard uh, and uh, Miguel and Kenneth. You've been a star and uh, we really learned together. And I really appreciate you sharing all your knowledge and experience with us. With these few words, everybody, let's uh, call it a day. I think you also need some rest. We also need some rest. And finally, uh, before we sign out, thanks to our IT person behind the scene, Brian Ng. Uh, he has done an excellent job. Thank you very much, all of you that have been involved. Adios. Bye-bye.